facial expressions. Uh oh. What's up, buddy? What's up, board Let me make you an admin. I, uh, hold on. Let me see. What's up, guys? Yep. I had thought that when I set up the live stream, it would show 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Instead, it showed 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. So I, it threw people off. It's sad, ain't it? Yesterday, when I put 5 p.m. Central Standard Time, it showed 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So it's like this YouTube page is ridiculous. Hey, 1611, how are you doing, brother? Lord Jesus bless you. Lord Jesus bless every one of you. Sajad, Gil, Ivan Petrov, Sunil Linus, Robbie Stones, Alan Ruhl, Orbiter, ma'am, all of you. God bless you. So I think people are not aware that I'm starting now. Some of them are going to... Some of them are waiting for 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Poor people. What's up, Revelation 22:13? How you doing? This is going to be my final part for at least a week because Lord Jesus willing, if the Lord wills, if the plans go through Sunday, a pastor and several brothers and sisters in Christ, myself, will be traveling in a van throughout the United States. We're going to visit several states. From the 12th to the 19th, God willing, and head back on the 19th, if the Lord Jesus wills, go out, you know, preach the gospel, evangelize, press out, pass out tracts, and see if we can meet Muslims locally. So pray for that. Pray for traveling mercies. Pray if it's God's will, it's going to go through. Pray the Lord Jesus will anoint us and fill us with the Spirit. Pray for our unity, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we'll be perfectly united. Pray it up. Filled with spirit, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Pray for our traveling expenses. Like I've said, if you guys want to contribute to my travels, you know, my Patreon pages, PayPal, you know, would appreciate it because we're in full time ministry for the glory of Jesus Christ. Good to see some of you. I'm just waiting a few more minutes. 1611. No, they're actually, you can contribute to either of the Patreon accounts. I had started the Shimon account about a year ago, but because of my personal problems, I had to start another account, Shemunian. But I got both of them. The Schumann account, uh, the funds were going to someone else that was a part of my life, put it this way, my ex-wife anyway. God have mercy on her. May the Lord Jesus grant her repentance leading to eternal life. Pray for her. The Lord Jesus have mercy on her and pray that Jesus will heal my heart to have mercy on her as well. Right. So but I got both accounts now. So glory to Jesus Christ. Yeah, sorry about that. Three, three veteran. I thought it was going to announce that I was going to start at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Instead, it showed, I guess, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Right. But anyway, I'll wait a few more minutes and we'll continue where I left off. Lord Jesus willing, this is the final session. <clears throat> until next week. God willing, if the Lord Jesus wills, I return around the 20th of next week. So if Jesus wills, when I return, I'll continue doing live streams and sessions for the glory of Jesus Christ. Yeah, you should set up. No, actually, Alan Rahul, I was told by those who have Super Chat that YouTube actually takes 50%. By the time the support comes in, you get only half of it. So that's a, that's a ripoff. All of these venues that we use do take a percentage paypal does patreon but super chat takes the most and as you know david wood myself and others we're in full-time ministry we need every penny we can get for the glory of jesus christ to keep doing this right just let's wait a few more minutes i don't know where first and last is yeah that's what i was told about 50 percent when it comes down to it they take about half so why even do it now, don't let that discourage you. If David Wood and Christian Prince wants you guys, want you guys to contribute on the Super Chat, then continue to do so. All right? I'm just saying, you know, that's, that's robbery. Everything's becoming a ripoff in America, especially where I'm at, Illinois, Chicago. It is unbelievably corrupt. 
Did you know that our mayor is a lesbian? We voted in a lesbian mayor, mayor who lives with her girlfriend and they have a daughter. Well, you don't like to hear your name? Well, people can see your name when they come here and they look at the live stream, even though it's recorded, they see the comments and they say they see the names of people. Sajad and Shepard's ambassador. So you can't hide that, my friend. Orbiter, you're here. I saw you're here, right? Yep, the Jesse Smollett thing, yeah. Very corrupt, Illinois. Pray, can you guys keep this in prayer? Ask the Lord Jesus to confirm that by the end of the summer I leave. I'm planning to leave the state unless the Lord decides otherwise. So pray for me because I need to leave. Chicago is not for me anymore. And pray that Jesus Christ, my Lord, will bless my daughters and protect them and preserve them and that they follow me. I have a debate with a oneness Pentecostal heretic. Lord Jesus willing, it's going to take place in Florida, July 13 and 14. It's two debates, one on the Hebrew scriptures. What do the Old Testament prophets say about God's nature? Is he unipersonal or tripersonal? And then the New Testament witness to the Trinity. So pray that the Spirit will fill me. I'll be bold as a lion, decimate the lies, the blasphemies of that oneness heretic, with the hopes that God will use those efforts to open his mind and the mind of the congregation to see who the true God is. Folks, don't deceive yourselves and don't be deceived. Oneness theology is a damnable blasphemous heresy. We don't worship the same God. I'm sorry. Their God is a false God. Either it's the Trinity or it's oneness. Both can't be right. Both can be wrong. Right? Both can't be right. Right? Both can be wrong. The cranes that intercede, you know, I love you, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. I really do. It's because the love of Jesus Christ compels us to do what we do. Honestly, I mean that. If it wasn't because the Spirit putting love in our hearts for Jesus, to love Jesus and want to live for him, even though I fail him miserably, struggling with my carnal fleshly desires, may the Holy Spirit crucify our flesh and destroy our flesh and save us to be doers of the word, not hypocrites. Because of our love for Jesus, we're here serving you. David Wood is doing it. He serves you because he loves you for the sake of Jesus. Christian per Prince serves you because he loves you for the sake of Jesus. But folks, remember one thing. When you have an assigned topic, it says who resembles Jesus. Muslims are Christians. Then what's the point of asking a question that would get the person to go off topic? I don't mean to be rude, but I want to teach you that when you come here and you see a topic, focus on the topic. Isaiah 7, 14 is a beautiful passage, but if I discuss Isaiah 7, 14, then I won't get into the topic of refuting Adnan Rashid's distortion of the scriptures. So as Christians, pray for me because I have many issues, but the Holy Spirit sanctifies us and transforms us to become more like Jesus and be patient with each other. Pray for me, pray for one another, that we learn to be disciplined, orderly, and focused because even Paul condemned disorderly worship. Chaotic worship services, chaos and disorder. That's in 1 Corinthians 14, specifically 33, where, God, where Paul says God is not a God of confusion, meaning God of disorder, but he's a God of order, and he wants things done orderly. You allow for the Holy Spirit to move in you. You don't try to constrain the Spirit. Obviously, if the Spirit moves you, then the Spirit is free and sovereign over the church. But it's the Spirit who told Paul that the Spirit ordains orderly worship. So let's stay focused. Yeah, well, if you mean my loss, my ex. So yeah, long story, brother. I'm not the only one. Ron runs on trails. Let me share some with you. I don't want to get into the topic. You'll be shocked of how many people I know in ministry, godly men, and they're godly women too. Don't go and get me wrong. But what I've noticed, the trend now, women are abandoning their husbands for adulterous relationships. It is so common, it's scary. I'm not the only one. I know a couple of brothers who love Jesus, some of whom are ministries. Their wives took off with men they met at the gym. So I'm not unique, unfortunately. I say this not with gladness. It's much more common than you think. And now... <laughs> It's the gym, the health club, where they're finding these immoral relationships. Go figure. Before it used to be the nightclubs. Now the health club, the gym, has taken over the nightclubs. 
So pray for marriages, especially among Christians, because it is heartbreaking to see how many Christians have ended up in divorce. And the trend with the women who profess faith in Jesus turning away from their husbands for sexually immoral relationships, for adultery that doesn't last, only to destroy their, their families and themselves. It's sad. Right? Right? It, it, it's very sad. It's sad. Anyway, with that said, let's begin and thank our brother Orbiter. He's going to be posting for us. He's going to be posting for us. And if you can remember, guys, you remember what I just said? Bento Fernandez, I guess, didn't listen. Remember I said we have a topic. We need to focus on the topic and not ask questions that will get me off topic. So he asked me a question that's off topic, Acts 5, verses 33 to 41. I don't think of it. Please, brethren, let us try to be orderly and focused and stick to the topic. In future sessions, if God wills, I promise, I'll open up the floor to Q&A. Today is not Q&A. I want to rebut Adnan Rashid, right? I was part of the terrible things that you did. Stacy. God forbid. <laughs> God forbid. <laughs> All right. Anyway, let's begin. Let's ask the God and Father of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to bless this session. We praise you, Father. We bless you, Father. We glorify you, Father. We magnify you, Father. Father, first I ask that you forgive me for my shortcomings and failures. It is sad that we who name the name of Jesus struggle in the flesh and sometimes succumb. Forgive us, Father. Forgive me. You know my sins. You know our sins. Wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Save us from the flesh. Crucify our flesh. Fill us with power from your spirit to walk in the spirit and to be filled with fruit and life from your spirit, Father. Wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ. Anoint this session in the power of your Holy Spirit. Wash our hearts, our minds, our souls, our beings in the blood of Jesus. Purify my motives, not to do it for the praise of men, Father, for the glory of Jesus. And give me the power to live what I preach perfectly for your glory. And bless everyone with the power of your spirit to live these truths for the glory of Jesus. Make us doers of your word, Father, in love with you, in love with Jesus, in love with your spirit. Enable me to recall scriptures and interpret them correctly. Protect me from stammering confusion. Bless everyone who's hearing the words to understand the words that I speak by the power of the Holy Spirit, that they will be planted in the depth of our beings to live out these truths for the glory of Jesus and to share it with Muslims until Muslims see the truth and fall in love with the truth who is jesus and turn away from islam father father give me the health i need to do this fill my lungs and my chest and my throat with life from your spirit anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants and bless them right now father and save us from attacks and distractions of the enemy we love you father please have mercy on us and forgive us forgive me we love your son the lord jesus we love your spirit have your way with us in jesus name amen as you can see it's my habit to pray but now for those of you who do pray for us and pray for me, pray in Jesus' name that the Holy Spirit will give me power to live holy unto Jesus, to obey Jesus, to be worshipful. Pray the Holy Spirit help me to get my health back, continue to lose weight and get healthier. Pray the Holy Spirit will bless my children, protect my children, provide for their needs and save them and convict their mother to repent and turn back to Jesus Christ. And pray for me to be Jesus to her and everyone else, all right? So please pray for me and pray for ministry. If you feel that God has called me to full-time ministry, to devote myself to teaching and writing and doing videos, then pray for the support, right? Let me just share a passage with you. Galatians chapter 6, verse 6. Now, first and last is here, and Orbiter is here. First and last, do you want to post until you can't anymore, or maybe you'll be able to do for the entire session? Let me see. I don't want to burden Orbiter. Do you want to post first and last? Let's see if he wants to post. Okay, all right, Orbiter, he's going to post for now, brother, but if you can just keep an eye on the text, if we get any trolls, you can muzzle them. Galatians 6.6, 6, let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. You see what it says? If you're taught the word, then communicate. Communicate here means share. Share with the one teaching you in all good things. See? As a Christian minister, David Wood, Christian Prince, and I cannot put a price tag on our preaching. We must preach freely, and we do it freely, 
and gladly for the glory of Jesus Christ. But then the scriptures teach the people of God that when you have teachers teaching you, you out of your own love for Christ and that man of God, bless that man of God, that woman of God, and provide for them to do it. So you see that, brethren? In other words, I never put a price tag on teaching. So if someone says, how much you charge? Free. The gospel is to be preached for free. But then the Lord says to those who receive the gospel and are being taught, now you bless the man of God and support him in the work. Now, if you choose to do that, that's between you and the Lord. If you don't, I still teach you anyway because I do it for the glory of Jesus and my reward is with my God. Is that clear? You with me there? Let me show you what I just said from the Lord himself. As a teacher, I cannot put a price tag on the gospel. I preach it freely out of love for Jesus. But as a church, the Lord then tells you, then bless that man of God and support him. If you choose to do so, God bless you. And if you don't, God bless you. We'll continue to teach you. But let me show you that in scripture. Matthew chapter 10, verses 8 to 10. And we're going to begin. I just want to put that in perspective. We are not beggars of men. We are beggars of Christ. He provides for us. My God will provide all our needs, our daily bread, especially for our families. Matthew 10, verses 8 to 10. Now watch here what our Lord says. Heal the sick. Cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses. Don't take gold or money with you. Why? Verse 10. Nor scrip for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. Did you see what he says? Don't you know, take money or provisions because in any home you, you settle, in that home that person will provide your wages for you. You don't put a price on it, you preach, but then that person will be moved by the Spirit then to contribute for your needs. Anyway, I saw, I don't want to mention it, Campbell, you know you are. Ain't that interesting, Campbell? You text when you want, and you show up when you want. I'm just a squirrel in your world. But anyway, God bless you. Let's begin. Yeah, I think reduce Red Russo next week as I travel, from state to state, one of the states that we're going to be at is in Michigan. Because pray for us next week, a pastor and some brothers and sisters, myself, are going to rent a van and we'll be driving throughout the country, several states, one, I one of which is Michigan, to preach the gospel and reach Muslims. So I may see you there in Jesus' name. All right, let's begin. I'm going to continue where we left off last session. We're going to continue to demonstrate that Jesus Christ receives the very worship due to God the Father. Not because he is God the Father, but because he's one with the Father in essence, and therefore worthy of the same glory, honor, praise, and worship, right? We're going to continue that because Adnan Rashid cited some passages out of context to give the impression that Jesus Christ isn't a, wasn't a Trinitarian because he worshipped a unipersonal God like Muslims do, that he worshipped the Father and didn't teach anyone to worship him. I refuted that yesterday, but I'm going to continue to refute it today. And then we're going to talk about the prayer posture. Those of you who listened to the debate, do you remember one of the arguments that Adnan raised was that Jesus prayed like Muslims or Muslims prayed pray like Jesus because Jesus fell down to the ground and prostrated his head to the ground like Muslims do. And he cited examples of other prophets doing the same. One of the examples he cited was Joshua in a passage that's going to backfire against him and is going to prove quite embarrassing. So are you guys ready? Are you ready for the meat by the power of the Holy Spirit? Let me just move this a little bit, right? So I can have more room to move. You guys ready for the meat? All right. Yep. Amen, Mighty Mouse. Thank you. I receive it. Who's ready for the meat? I don't know if you guys can even hear me. Okay. Now... Yeah, Joshua 5, 13, 15, which is going to backfire against him, 16, 11, because that's Jesus Christ appearing to Joshua. But let's continue. I'm going to look at other passages where Jesus is worshipped as God Almighty. Let's look at Psalm 145, verse 18. Psalm 145, 18. In Jesus' name. Psalm 4, as the Lord enables me to recall Scripture correctly and live it out by the power of the Holy Spirit. Psalm 145, verse 18. Psalm 
Watch here. May the Lord Jesus keep us pure physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, covering us by his blood and fill us with the spirit. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. So you call on the name of the Lord. You call on the Lord. Genesis 21, 33. Genesis 21, 33. Thank first and last and Orbiter and Revelation and Alan for adminning and making it easier for me. Now looks, let's look at Genesis 21, 33. I don't know what H-G-G-F-H-H means. Even me, I don't know. And Abraham planted a grove in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, Yahovah. He called on the name of Jehovah, the everlasting God. Notice the whole Testament from beginning to end shows that the true worshipers are those who call on the name of Jehovah. Now, let me explain what that meant. We talked about it briefly yesterday, but let me unpack what it means. Calling on the name of Jehovah means to pray to him. Calling on the name of Jesus, uh, Jehovah, here it's Jehovah, means that you pray to him. You ask him. You invoke him for your needs. You praise him. You thank him. You speak to him. That's what calling on the name of Jehovah means. According to the scriptures, the Old Testament, true worshipers are to call on the name of Jehovah alone. You will never find in the Hebrew Bible where a true believer who's walking in obedience to God calls on the name of someone other than Jehovah, right? And what does it mean to call on his name? To call on it means to pray to him, to praise him, to thank him, to invoke him for your needs. Okay, now, if that's clear, I can give you many more passages. Let's go back and see what the New Testament says <clears throat> Christians were known for doing. In fact, they even got in trouble for this practice. One of the reasons why Paul was persecuting Christians is because of this practice. What practice? Let's go to Acts 9, which recounts Paul's conversion story. Jesus, our Lord, appears to Ananias and prepares Ananias to go meet Paul to get him saved. After Paul saw Jesus and was blinded by the glorious illumination of Christ. Let's go to Acts 9. We're going to read verses 10 to 14. Now, let me know if I'm clear or if I'm confusing you guys. If I'm confusing you guys, ask me to slow down and repeat. Acts 9, 10 to 14. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision. So Jesus is appearing in a vision to his disciple. Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight. And inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. So go to the street called Straight. There's a man in that house, the house of Judas, and he's praying. Saul is praying. And hath seen, and Saul has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive a sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Now let me tell you how much meat is in this section. Number one, notice Jesus Christ from heaven is appearing to his servants on earth in visions. Who does Jesus think he is that from heaven he can appear to his servants in visions? That's number one. I want you to catch these points. Number two, notice the irony. Saul is in the home of a man named Judas, and his home is on Straight Street. Did you catch it? Straight Street, the straight road, the straight path. What Muslims pray daily for Allah to guide them on. Sirat al Mustaqim, the straight path. And here Paul was on the straight path, the straight path that led to salvation, <clears throat> which is faith in Jesus Christ. Did you guys catch it? You guys got it? Is it a coincidence or is it irony that the man's house, Judas's house, where Saul was waiting for Ananias, was located on Straight Street, the straight path? Because Saul had now been introduced to the straight path. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Wow. You got it? You see how much meat in there? But now the third thing. Did you notice that our Lord Jesus said to Ananias that Saul has seen a vision of Ananias? 
and he's seen Ananias coming to Saul. Saul saw this man, who he's never met before, coming to him and laying hands on him and saving him. You understand what that means? Let me explain what that means. Jesus gave Saul a vision of Ananias. Jesus gave Saul a vision of Ananias. So that when Ananias comes and Saul's eyes open, Saul will recognize Ananias as the man in his vision, providing supernatural divine confirmation that Saul was not hallucinating, but that he did see Jesus. After all, how would Ananias know that Jesus had shown Ananias to Saul in a vision? And how would Ananias know that Saul saw Jesus and was converted? Because Saul and Ananias never met each other. For someone to come to Saul and tell Saul what happened to him without that person having, having been there to see it would then convince Saul and everyone around Saul, Saul beyond any reasonable doubt that Jesus is alive and more real than you can imagine and did show up to Saul. You see that? You understand why the vision? Because how are you going to explain that away? Ananias, how did you know I'm Saul? How did you know I'm in this house? How did you know Jesus appeared to me and blinded me? And how did you know that Jesus showed you to me in a vision? How do you know all that? Because Saul, that's Jesus' way of showing you, you really did see Jesus. He really is alive. He really is risen. He really reigns in heaven as Lord. Is it sinking in before I move on? And this will also reassure Ananias that when he goes to the home of Judas and finds the home on that street and finds Saul blinded, then he will know that Jesus did appear to Saul and he has nothing to fear because now Jesus has changed Saul to become one of the greatest Christians that has ever lived, giving us half the New Testament. Is it making sense or no? Before I move on, I want to make sure it's sinking in. Okay. I want to make sure it's sinking in. That's why I'm waiting. I know there's a six second delay between when I say something and it comes to you. It's now, before I move on, honestly, is this blowing you away? The depth of scripture, the meat of scripture, and all this supernatural confirmation? God has given us in Scripture that Scripture is His Word and Jesus is Lord. I just want to know. Before I move on. Okay. Now let's continue reading. Let's read again Acts 9, 13 to 14. Now you pray for me that God continues to give me the wisdom, illumination to see the beauty of Scripture so I can share it with you and the power then to live for Jesus, not to be a hypocrite because we got to live for him. The more we know, the less we do, the greater our judgment. But let's read Acts 9, 13 and 14. Read with me, guys. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he had done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. Here's my question for you. What in the world are the Jews doing in Jerusalem being associated with Christ as his saints? Notice it says, Jesus, this man has done much evil to your saints in Jerusalem. But hold on, hold on. Why would monotheistic Jews be the saints of Christ, the holy ones of Christ, when the Bible is quite clear Believers are only the set-apart holy ones of God in heaven. But here it says, Jesus, they're your saints, and your saints are the Jews in Jerusalem who believe in you. Do you see that? Jesus has holy ones on earth while he's in heaven, and he has Jewish holy ones in Jerusalem of all places, the heart of monotheism. Yep. And then 14, notice what Ananias says. And here hath authority from the chief, chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. The chief priests have given authority to come to Syria, Damascus, Syria, 
to imprison all who call on your name, Jesus? Another question. What in the world are these Christians doing calling on the name of Jesus when we just read in the Old Testament? Believers are those who call on the name of the Lord Jehovah. Why are believers calling on the name of Jesus? And why is Jesus approving it? Put Acts 9.14 one more time. Watch here. Acts 9.14 one more time because I want you guys to catch it. Thank you, first and last. Watch here. You got it. Acts 9.14, watch it one more time. See what it says. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Why are you guys calling on the name of Jesus when you know the only one whose name you call upon who's in heaven is Jehovah? So Jesus is being worshipped. In the same way Jehovah was worshipped in the Old Testament. Yeah, hit that like button. Make this YouTube page go viral for the glory of Christ. So they're praying to Jesus in the same way the Old Testament saints pray to Jehovah. Jesus is receiving the same honor that Jehovah receives, that the Father receives. Right? You ain't there? Now let's continue reading from 15 to 17, Acts 9, 15 to 17. I hope Revelation 22 and the rest of you now, some of you have already heard this, like uh, Orbiter, he's been with me for years, so I'm preaching to the choir. He's heard this over and over again, but it's still refreshing to hear it again and again and again, right? Because you never get bored of it. Now let's read Acts 9, 15 to 17. Pay attention. But the Lord said unto him, Ananias, go thy way. Go, don't be afraid, Ananias. Go, I've told you, go. For he is a chosen vessel unto me. I have chosen him for me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I, Jesus speaking in a vision to Ananias, will show Paul, him, how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. He will bear my name, preach my name, proclaim my name, and suffer for my name. Because he's mine. Now notice 17. And Ananias went his way and entered in the house. And putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord. Even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Wow. Wait. How did Ananias know the Lord Jesus appeared to you, Saul, and he sent me to you to receive your sight in his name, performing a miracle, and be filled with the Holy Spirit? See, this was God's way of convincing Paul, Paul, you are not hallucinating. This is no hallucination. You truly saw Jesus alive in glory from heaven. He truly did appear to you. Because how do you explain that this stranger whom you've never met knows what happened to you and you were shown what he looks like in a vision and lo and behold, he's right in front of your eyes. What more proof could God give us for the truth of the gospel, for the legitimacy of Paul, and for the Lordship of Christ? Now let's read 18 to 21. 18 to 21. Muslims would wish they had even a tenth, a scintilla of this evidence for their false prophet. Acts 9, 18 to 21. And immediately there fell from his eyes as had been scales, and he received his sight forwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he ate, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straight away, after he was thoroughly trained and taught the way of Christ, right away after he was taught, spending time with disciples, he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Right? Now notice, and came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest. I don't know what you did. You, you butchered 21. First and last, you, you posted the second part of 21 first. Let me read 20 again. And straight away he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he's the son of God. So right away he went telling the Jews, folks, this Jesus that you crucified at the hands of the Romans, he is real. He's alive. He is Lord. He's the son of God. We were wrong. We need to believe in him. Now watch 21. Acts 9, 21. 
First last, you posted the second part first. Let's try it again. But all that heard him were amazed, pay attention, and said, is not this he that destroyed them, which called on this name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? Did you catch it? Isn't this the man that was destroying the people in Jerusalem of all places that was calling on that name? Jews in Jerusalem were calling on the name of Jesus, and this man was persecuting them for that. Did you catch it? Of all places, Jerusalem, you have Jews at that time calling on the name of Jesus Christ, which angered the unbelieving Jews like Paul to the point that they were persecuted for it. Why were the Jews in Jerusalem calling on the name of Jesus Christ? Why was James the Lord's brother, Peter, a Jew, John, James, Thomas, why were the Jewish believers in Jerusalem calling on the name of Jesus? In my screen, it showed the second part first. Then he posted it again, and it came in the right order. Can you explain that to me? Why were Jews calling on the name of Jesus in Jerusalem, the one place where idolatry would not be tolerated? Can you explain that to me? Before I move on, help me out, folks. You got it, Sajjad. These Jews realized that that flesh and blood Jew, Jesus, was more than a man. He's God in the flesh. So here's my question to every one of you. Why would Adnan even bother quoting the Gospels? the New Testament, to try to prove that Jesus and Muslims are similar in that Jesus worshipped a unipersonal God, namely the Father, when in all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the New Testament as a whole, <clears throat> these inspired documents, first century accounts, documents, go out of their way to show that Jesus and his followers taught and his followers performed worship of the risen Christ, honoring him, Loving him, glorifying him, praising him, praying to him in the same way that Old Testament saints honored, loved, glorified, praised, worshipped, and prayed to Jehovah. Why would he do this? Because we know why. He is of his father, the devil, until Jesus saves him from Satan, unlike Muhammad, who died under the influence of Satan. Okay. It's going to get better now. Let's go back to Revelation, which he quoted. He cited Revelation to show that angels worship like Muslims, or Muslims worship like angels, and angels bow down. Okay. <laughs> oh, boy. Let's go to Revelation 5. Let's turn it against him. We're going to discuss Joshua then. Okay. Let's go to Revelation 5 and read verses 8 to 14. But now here's what I want you to do. First and last, post-Revelation 5, verses 8 to 10. We're going to break it down in sections. Revelation 5, 8 to 10. Exactly, said John. He mentioned Revelation in his debate. Go listen. So that's why I'm quoting Revelation. He can't then say, well, Revelation's not reliable. You cited it. Now let's read Revelation 5, 8 to 10. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb. There you go. That's how Muslims worship, you remember? He said, see, in Revelation, angels fall down like Muslims do. Hold on, friend. It says they fell down before the Lamb. So are you telling me Muslims fall down before Jesus? Having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. Right? And they sung a new song, saying, thou art, they're singing to Jesus, thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain. You, the Lamb, Jesus, were slain, so you are worthy, because you are slain, slain, and has redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Wow. Adnan quotes Revelation to show that angels bow down like Muslims do, but he forgot to tell you, that the angels were bowing down to Jesus the Lamb and singing to the Lamb, praising the Lamb. 
Can you be any more dishonest? Now, Revelation 5, 11 to 12. Revelation 5, 11 to 12. Watch here. Revelation 5, 11, 12. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels. Now watch here. Now you tell me if Muslims resemble angels here. Many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb. There you go again. The Lamb is now worshipped by all of God's angelic creatures. Worthy is the Lamb. That was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Sure sounds like the entire heavenly host, all the inhabitants of heaven, are worshiping Jesus in the exact same way that God the Father is worshipped. Marijuana or marijuana. I'm sorry. I called you marijuana. At least in the case of Adnan, he must know this because he quoted it. That means he read it. Right? Oh, but now the annihilation, obliteration, decimation of Muhammad, his religion, his God, and all anti Trinitarian groups. Revelation 5 13. This passage destroys all anti Trinitarian groups Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Christadelphian heretics, right? Oneness, Pentecostal heretics, and Islam. Revelation 5 13. Why? Why? Why do I say that? Let's look. Okay, read Revelation 5.13. Again, from my screen, the second part of the verse is appearing before the first part. That's okay. I'll read it. Read Revelation 5.13. Pay attention to the language. We're going to now read over this slowly so that you can let it sink in, simmer in. And every creature, not some, John is also included. So John is seeing himself worshiping because God can do that. God can show you yourself in a future scene worshiping and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and as such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard i saying did you catch it he exhausts the language so you don't miss it every creature that exists in entire creation every creature everywhere in creation every creature every created thing heard i saying Blessing and honor and glory and power unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Whoa. This right there should drop you to your knees with your face to the ground in worship, honor, and love of the Father and the Son. Notice every creature in existence gives Jesus the Lamb the same exact worship that the Father receives, and they do so forever and ever. Catch it? Now, Revelation 22, 13, the reason why I limit myself to Revelation is because Adnan quoted Revelation, but he attacked Paul. So if I go to Philippians 2, 9, 11, he goes, well, Paul corrupted the message, which Lord Jesus willing, in a future session, I'm going to rebut. The Lamb not only loves you, Jason, he's in love with you. He's in love with us. Collectively and individually. Jesus is in love with me. He's in love with you. And he proved it by dying for us. Do you catch it? Let's post Revelation 5, 13 one more time so, so it can sink in. One more time so it can sink in. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them. See, every creature in the entire created world heard I saying, blessing and honor and glory and power unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. This proves two things. Number one, Jesus is no mere creature. Because if he's a creature, then he would be joining every created thing in existence, worshiping God. But instead, Every created thing is on one side, and the Lamb is separated from them, and he's on the other side, the side of God. This passage by itself proves Jesus is eternal, uncreated, almighty, and equal to the Father.
And it proves the second thing. Jesus, because he is uncreated and eternal like the Father is, is worthy of the same worship to the same degree that the Father is worthy of, which is why every creature worships Jesus the same way they worship God the Father. Amen, runs on trails. May your love and our love, my love for Jesus, get stronger and stronger and stronger. We have a piece of garbage, son of Satan, who doesn't know who his father is, using foul language. Admins, get rid of skeleton. Bury him with his prophet. Please, admins. Revelation 22, please, my friend, help me. You're an admin for a reason. Love you, man. Okay. Did you catch it? Why would it not say in the book of Revelation, angels worship the way Muslims do when Revelation shows angels and every created thing in existence worshiping Jesus the same way they worship the Father? So let's finish Revelation by looking at Revelation 5, 13 and 14 together. Revelation 5, 13 and 14. Apostate prophet, God bless you, bro. I know you don't believe God exists, but he knows he exists, and he created you for his glory. And in Jesus' name, that God will make himself known to you, and you're going to fall in love with Jesus, and you're going to join me. Apostate prophet has joined us. God bless you, my friend. Bless you by bringing you to Jesus. Anyway, let's read Revelation 5, 13, 14 again, together. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Now notice 14. Guys, notice 14. And the four beasts said, Amen. So shall it be, and it will be. And the four and twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. The, the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. We know that includes God the Father. God the Father lives forever. But when it says they fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever, does that include Jesus? Is Jesus included in that description of the one who lives forever and ever? Yep. Revelation 1, 17 to 18. Revelation 1, 17 to 18. I got to blow up like apostate prophet and David Wood. Their channel bl has blown up. They get thousands, man. Pray for me. Come on. I'm getting envious. And envy is a sin. Revelation 1, 17 to 18. Watch here. Is Jesus the one who lives forever and ever? And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. So this is Jesus. I'm the one who lives and died. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. He is the one who lives forever and ever, forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. Notice several things about what Jesus says here. Number one. He holds the keys of hell and of death. You know what that means? It means Jesus has power over life and death. Death is in his hands. Hell is in his hands. He determines when you die and where you will go. I hold the keys. I have the authority over hell and death. That's something only God can say because only God has power over death and life. Right? It's number one. Number two, he lives forever and ever, right? Something that Revelation ascribes to the true God alone. And thirdly, which is again shocking, because this happens to be a name of Allah in the Quran, Jesus says, I am the first and the last. I am he that lives and was dead. Jesus says, I am the first and the last. Now, why is that important? Let's go to chapter 57, verse 3 of the Quran. Chapter 57, verse 3 of the Quran. And this is the book that Adnan quoted to try to prove Muslims are more like Jesus than Christians are. Can you believe that? Of all the books you can quote, you quote this one. It's stuck for Allah. It's stuck for, for Messiah. Anyway, chapter 57, verse 3 of the Quran. Read with me. He is the first and the last, and the outward and the inward. He is the knower of all things. So notice the Quran says, Allah's the first and last. Now, Allah's not God, but still, be that as it may, the Quran acknowledges Allah is the first and the last. Al awwal wal akhir. These are two of the 90 name, 99 names of Allah. This is why I always set up Muslims with Revelation 117. I read Revelation 117 and I say to them, 
read this for me. I'll read it for them. And, and then when I read it, it says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. He placed his right hand upon me and said, do not be afraid. I'm the first and last. And I stopped there. I go according to the Quran, which we just read. Who's speaking? Who just said, I'm the first and last? Without hesitation, they say Allah. Then I say, when did your God Allah die? They go, what do you mean? Let's read 18. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I, I'm alive forevermore. So when did your God Allah die? Because the Quran just said, the first and last is the name of God alone. Here, Revelation 117, the first and last says he died in verse 18 and came to life. So when did your God Allah die? And they go, no, that's not God, that's Jesus. Oh, thank you for now admitting Jesus claimed to be God. And that's when they say your book is corrupt. Oh, your book is corrupt. But Adnan, didn't you just quote Revelation? Oh, yeah, I only quoted it when it helped make my case. But now that you embarrassed me, Revelation's no good. You catch it? So is it clear from the words of Jesus Christ, the words of his followers, the examples of his followers, Jesus commanded and received the very same worship that the Father receives because Jesus is not the Father, but one with the Father in essence, therefore worthy of the same glory, honor, and praise. Is that clear? We went in depth on it yesterday, and I'm touching upon it again in this session. Is that clear? There's, there's more I can show you about the worship of Christ. Lord willing, in the future, I'll do a multi-part a multi series, if God wills, on the New Testament teaching in regards to the worship of Christ. We'll look at doxologies. We'll look at prayers. We'll look at petitions given to Jesus showing he's God. Invocations showing he's God. But that would require more than one session. So God willing, sometime after next week, if I return by the grace of God, and I get into the pattern of doing more live streaming, I will do a multi-part multi series on the worship given to Jesus in the Bible. Would you guys be interested in that? Jason, that too in time, God willing. Bible's preservation. Would you be interested in me going in depth on what the Bible teaches as a whole in respect to the worship given to Christ, worship that only God is supposed to be given? If you guys are interested, we'll do that. Now let's deal with his claim that in Matthew 26, 39 and other places in the Hebrew Bible, the prophets of God and Jesus fell down on their faces like Muslims do in worship. Let's go to Matthew 26, 39. Because now it's going to backfire against him. By the way, Lisa and everyone else, all of this material you'll find on my websites because I've written over 200 articles on all these topics. And I have dozens of articles on just the topic of the worship given to Jesus. So you need to exercise some discipline and start reading again. We've forgotten the art of reading. YouTube has, has spoiled us in that we want to watch and listen, not read. But I promise you, if you read the articles and rebuttals, you'll have all this information at your disposal to use in your Bible classes, <clears throat> in your gatherings, in your apologetic classes, and in your ministry. Use the material for the glory of Christ. Matthew 26, 39. What happened to first and last? He's not posting? Okay, that's fine. All right. Matthew 26, 39. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed. See, Adnan says, you see? Alhamdulillah. We Muslims resemble Jesus. We fall on our faces and pray like Jesus did. Okay, hold on. Let's finish it. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Number one. This prayer is in the context of Jesus being betrayed and handed over to be crucified and killed and buried. You're actually going to quote a verse from a chapter that details Jesus is being betrayed after accepting God's will that 
he must die for the salvation of God's people, beaten to a bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death, then nailed on the cross, died and buried, and then rises again. You're going to quote this verse to prove that Jesus is a Muslim and prayed like you Muslims? Number two, when Jesus prayed, he addressed God as, Oh, my father. Which Muslim would dare pray and say, Allah, Oh, Allah, you are my father. I have challenged Muslims to say on a live stream so we can record them saying it and post it on YouTube for all to say, I want you to say right now, Ya Allah, you are my father. You are my father, Oh, Allah, like Jesus did. Not one of them take me up on the challenge. Not one, because they know that as far as the Quran is concerned, they cannot address Allah as their father. So how dare does Adnan cite a passage to show that Jesus prayed like Muslims when in that prayer he calls God my father, Abba in Aramaic, according to Mark 14. This verse actually proves that the God that Jesus prayed to is not Muhammad's God. Because Muhammad's God is a father to no one, yet the God that Jesus prayed to is his father and our father who believe in Jesus, showing that God that Jesus proclaimed is not Allah of the Quran and Muhammad is a false prophet. This very verse that he quoted. Amazing, right? Thirdly, you want to know what the third problem is with saying that Jesus and the prophets prayed like Muslims or Muslims pray like Jesus and the prophets? You want to know what the third problem is? You guys ready for the third problem? Just let me know if you're ready for the third problem. And we're going to finish it with Joshua. The third problem. Here's the third problem. Go on YouTube, type in Muslim prayer, and you'll see that when Muslims pray, they do what's called prayer rounds, raqat. In that prayer round, they'll be standing. Either they'll have their hands folded by their chest or by their stomach, right? Then they will bow down, stand up, and then fall prostrate to the ground. That's called one raqa. Are you with me there? So they'll do this, right? Then they'll put their hands on their knees and bow, stand up again, and then fall to the ground. I challenge Adnan, and I challenge his cronies to show me a single example in the Bible where Jesus and the prophets prayed that way. They would stand up with their hands folded. They would then prostrate, bend their body, not fully to the ground, stand up again, and then fall to the ground prostrate. You see how wickedly dishonest, deceitful, wickedly deceptive that is to show a case where Jesus falls prostrate on the ground with his face to the ground and use that to show Muslims pray like Jesus, but forget to tell us that that's not how Muslims pray exactly. They stand up, hands folded, they'll bend forward, stand up and fall to the ground, prostrate. And in some prayers, they'll do two rounds of it. Other times they'll do four rounds of it. Show me a single prophet that did a prayer like that. Can anyone show me? Do you see how wickedly dishonest that is? I will in time, God willing. So we now, we now just decimated that lie from Adnan, that Muslims resemble Jesus and the prophets as they pray. Let's deal with an example that he cited. He quoted jo Joshua 5.14, and this will be further decimation of Islam and Adnan and his polemics, showing that Muhammad is a false prophet and antichrist, and Jesus is risen, he is Lord, he is alive, and he's the God and judge of Muhammad. I mean, the Lord Jesus grant Adnan and others repentance leading to life, right? He quoted Joshua 5.14. Let's look at Joshua 5.14. I have time to unpack this. Just MC, the problem is, is that Super Chat, I was told, takes about half of 
the proceeds. So if you were to donate on Super Chat, let's say 100, they'll take about 50. Better you contribute via Patreon, and the fastest way is my PayPal. All of that is in the description bo box, and I'd appreciate your support by the grace of Jesus Christ. But anyway, <laughs> Joshua 514, Orbiter is going to post. We're waiting for Orbiter. Thank you, Shepherd's Ambassador. Exactly. Just bear with me. I'm going to wait for Orbiter unless he wants me to read it out loud. Can you do it, brother, or do you want me to read it? All right, thank you. Here's what he quoted. Guys, read. Here's what Adnan quoted to show that Joshua prays like Muslims. Watch. Read. And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? I cannot believe for the life of me he would quote this passage. Do you know why? If you read Joshua 5.14 in context, the one that Joshua fell down and worshipped, was none other than Jesus Christ in his pre-human existence. Are you ready for me to prove it? This example is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus, whom Joshua recognized and worshipped as his Lord. Are you ready for the evidence? Are you ready? Hannah Haddad, they'll tell you that's why the Orthodox Church is not following Jesus. Don't fall for that trap. Don't let them use that as, an, as a reason to attack the churches. Christophany, appearance of Christ. Let's do it. Joshua 5, 13 and 15. Now, guys, let's read. Focus on the context. Don't get distracted by side discussion. Watch here. Joshua 5, 13 and 15. Focus. I'm going to prove to you. This is not God the Father. This is a divine being distinct from the Father who is Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you. Joshua 5, 13 and 15. But you guys got to read. Read. Thank Orbiter for posting. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, there stood a man. So Joshua was seeing a man on the horizon over against him with a sword drawn in his hand. So pay attention. A man with a sword in his hand. Pay attention. Number one. A man with a sword in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversaries? Are you here to fight us or fight for us? And he said, Nay, neither. I'm not here to fight you or fight for you. Why? But as captain, I don't cheat on that. As the captain, I have a psycho sitting next to me, so bear with me. As captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? I'm not here to serve you or fight for you. You're going to fight for me and serve me. You know why? Because I am the captain of the hosts of the Lord. I am the commander of the armies of the Lord. I command God's armies in heaven and on earth. Did you catch it? That's who I am. When Joshua realized that's who the man is, notice his reaction. Joshua fell on his face for the man. He fell not for God in heaven, but the man standing in front of him. He fell on his face before that man. And worshipped him and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto a servant? And he realized this one, because he's the commander of the armies of heaven and earth, he is worthy of my worship. He is my Lord. I am his servant. Now notice what he says then in verse 15. Guys, pay attention. And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot. So notice three things. For the place whereon thou standest is holy, and Joshua did so. Notice, he says, in my presence, you got to remove your sandals, because whatever I touch becomes holy. Remove your shoes from my presence, because the ground that I've touched is holy. So number one, the commander of the armies of God appears as a man with a sword in his hand. Number two, this commander, this captain, whatever he touch, touches becomes holy and sacred ground. And so the man, Joshua, had to remove his sandals in his presence. Number three, this man is worshipped by Joshua. Joshua recognizes he's my Lord. I'm a servant worthy of worship. Do you remember? So did you catch those three points? Did you catch those three points? This man has a sword in his hand to do battle. This man is worshipped. He is the Lord of God's people, and they are his servants. And in his presence, you have to remove your sandals. Do you catch those three points? Put a one if you caught it. 
or a yes? Because I'm going to show you that the commander, the captain of the host of the Lord is none other than Jesus Christ, the angel of God. Okay, let's see who this commander is. This commander, this captain is the same figure as the angel of God who appears in the Old Testament as God, who's worshipped as God. Let me prove it to you. Numbers 22, 31 to 32. Numbers 22, 31 to 32. Numbers 22, 31 to 32. Watch here. We're going to get there, Mighty Mouse. Just bear with me. Numbers 22, 31 to 32. Watch here. But 31, 32 specifically, because watch the connection. The angel is the captain. The captain is the angel. Both of them appear in human form as men. Both of them have swords in their hands to use to wield against God's enemies. Both of them are worshipped as Lord, as God. And in the presence of both of them, you have to remove your sandals because they're one and the same. Watch here. Numbers 22, 31, 32, he posted it. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, his sword drawn in his hand. So the angel has a sword in his hand. And he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. Did you catch it? When Balaam recognized the angel, he saw the sword in his hand. He fell down on his face before the angel bowed his head to the ground, fell on his face before the angel. So notice the connection. The angel, like the captain, has a sword in his hand to wield against God's enemies. The angel, like the captain, receives worship and no rebuke for those worshiping them. And the third connection, the angel, like the captain, is so holy that in his presence you have to move your sandals. Let us see what 32 says. And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Let's go to Exodus 3, verses 1 to 6. Exodus 3, verses 1 to 6. The three similarities. The angel, like the captain, appears in visible form as a man with a sword in his hand. The angel, like the captain, is worshipped by his subjects. The angel, like the captain, is so holy that whatever he touches becomes sacred, holy, sanctified, and you have to remove your shoes from his presence. Exodus 3, verses 1 to 6. Let's read, guys. PR and C team, let's read. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he fled the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Now notice who appeared to him. Not God the Father. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. So appeared in visible form as fire out of the midst of the bush. The angel of the Lord. Notice, angel of the Lord. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will not turn aside. I will now turn aside, Lord, loosen my tongue, and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called out unto him out of the midst of the bush. Now read too, folks. The one who's in the midst of the bush, appearing as a flame of fire, is the angel of the Lord. But then in verse 4 says, God was in the bush calling to him. Moses, Moses, and he said, here am I. And he said, draw not nigh hither, don't get any closer. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Wow. The only two places in scripture where someone's told, remove your sandals, is here when the angel of God appears in the bush, and in Joshua when the captain of the host of the Lord appeared. Now watch verse 6. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Now, folks, I'm confused. It says God was in the bush. God was speaking. God said to Moses, remove your sandals. God said to Moses, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Moses was afraid to look at God. But hold on. Wait. Let's look at Exodus 3, verse 2, and verse 4, side by side. Exodus 3, verse 2 and verse 4, side by side. Watch here. Now read with me. Who appeared in the bush? 
And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. Now notice 4, verse 4. And when the Lord Jehovah saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush. Okay. Who's in the bush? The angel or God? Verse 2 says the angel of the Lord Jehovah was in the bush. Verse 4 says it was God in the bush who called out to Moses. So who is in the bush? The angel or God? So who is it? The angel or God? PR and first got it. Rob got it. But Joe James, it says it was the angel in the bush. Come on, help me out. The angel's in the bush. Where did God come from? H, it says the angel in verse 2. You're not paying attention. Come on. How can it be God calling from the bush in verse 4 when it's the angel in verse 2 that's in the bush? A couple of you got it. I want to make sure you got it. No, medic. There is no Yahweh the Father there, so you didn't get it. Come on. Figure it out. The angel's in the bush. God is in the bush. What does that tell you? Come on. Many of you got it. So who was in the bush? The angel or God? Mighty Mouse, it says God in verse 4. If you guys can't explain it to me, then you won't be able to help others see. And it doesn't use the word Jesus. Stop telling me Jesus. Yes, medic. That's the point. The angel is God. When the angel appears, God appears because the angel is God. Thank you, medic. Now you're getting it. To look at the angel is to look at God because the angel is God. Because the word angel means messenger. Angel in the Bible isn't a spirit creature with wings. Angel means messenger. A messenger can be a spirit creature from heaven, can be a human being, or it can be one of the persons of the Godhead, a member of the Trinity, being sent by another member as his messenger. So this angel is not a creature. This angel is sent by God, and this angel happens to be God, who appears in human form, in visible form, to God's servants. And I'm going to show you that angel is Jesus in a minute. Everyone with me there? Now, if you go on my YouTube channel, Shemunian, I have an entire session an entire session on the angel of God in the Old Testament being God who then becomes Jesus Christ. So listen to my talk on this. Okay, but now here's the question for all of you. Did you see that the angel in the bush who is God appearing in visible form and Moses realized that was God because it says he's afraid to look at God and the angel as God says, I, the angel, am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That angel told Moses, remove your sandals in my presence. Only two places in the Bible do you find the command to remove sandals from the feet of the one beholding God. In Exodus 3, the angel tells Moses, remove your sandals. In Joshua 5, the captain of the hosts of the Lord tells Joshua, remove your sandals. So do you see that the angel is the captain? The captain is the angel. The angel of God. He's not a creature. He's a messenger sent by God, who is God, is the captain of the armies of God. Like the captain, the angel has a sword in his hand and appears in visible form. Like the captain, his subjects worship him because they realize this is no creature but God appearing in visible form. And like the captain, in his presence, you have to remove your sandals. Why? Because the captain of the army of the Lord that Joshua saw is none other than the angel of God that Moses saw. They're one and the same. Did you get it? Before I move on, because we're almost done. Did you get it? Put a one if you're getting it. Thank you, Jason. That's the whole purpose of these sessions, to views of the Spirit, to make you see how amazing the Bible is. To understand it so you can see its depth and beauty and fall madly in love with the God of that, of that Bible. 
These are the proofs that God gives us. He's real, and this is his book. Okay, now, I'm going to prove to you this is Jesus. The angel of God is the captain of the army of the Lord. They're one of the same person. They appear in human form. They have a sword in their hand ready to fight God's enemies. They command God's people. God's people realize that this entity is God appearing in human form, which is why they worship that entity and why they have to remove their sandals in his presence. Now, to show you that this is not a mere spirit creature, this is not an angelic creature, angels refuse to be worshipped. Ivan Petrov, why would you be confused? I just spent 10 minutes explaining to you. Angel means messenger. Why are you confused? Isn't Jesus the Father's messenger? Isn't he the Father's angel? If angel means messenger, someone sent with a message. Isn't Jesus an angel in that the Father sent Jesus with a message? So why would you be confused, brother? Come on, wake up, man, before I lay hands on you knock you out, bro. Okay. To prove to you that this angel, this captain, is not a creature, angelic creatures do not receive worship. Let's go to Revelation 22, 8 to 9. Do not receive worship. Revelation 22, 8 to 9. Watch here. Revelation 22, 8 to 9. It's going to come up in a minute. Watch here. Before the rapture orbiter, we're going to leave you behind. All right, Revelation 22, 8 to 9. Read with me. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Notice what the angel says. Then saith he unto me, see thou, do it not. Don't do it. Don't fall at my feet and worship. For I, am I, for I am thy fellow servant. I am a servant of you and a servant like you. And of thy brethren, the prophets, of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. Angelic creatures refuse to be worshipped. Then why did the captain of the host of the Lord allow Joshua to fall flat on his face before him and worship him? Why did the captain of the army of the Lord allow Joshua to call him my Lord and Joshua call himself his servant? Why? Angels do not accept worship. They are servants like us and they serve us. But the captain of the host of the Lord received the worship of Joshua. When Joshua fell on his face to the ground before him, he goes, what does my Lord ask of his servant? Acknowledging, you're my Lord, I'm your servant. He didn't say, hey, hey, don't do that. Don't do that. When Balaam, Balaam fell to the ground, before the angel of God, the angel of God said, hey, hey, don't do that. Do you know why? Because the angel who's the captain is not a creature. He is God, sent by God as God's messenger. Now, are you ready for the proof that this angel is Jesus Christ? The captain of the host of the Lord is Jesus Christ? The commander of the host of the Lord, the commander of the armies of the Lord is Jesus Christ. Are you ready for the proof? Let's read Joshua 5.14, and we're almost done. I'm almost done with this session. Joshua 5.14. Okay, watch here. Joshua 5.14. One more time, so you can make the connection. And he said, nay, but as captain, that word also means commander, of the hosts of the Lord. Host means the armies of Jehovah. As captain of his army, Am I now come? And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? Let's see who is the captain, the commander, the Lord of the armies of God. Revelation 19, 11 to 16. Yep, Genesis 19, 24 is a good one. But there it doesn't say angel. It says Jehovah on earth as a man brought fire from Jehovah. Revelation 19, 11 to 16.
Revelation 19, 11 to 16. Read with me. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. Pay attention, folks. Read this. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. The rider on the white horse makes war righteously. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Now notice who this is, the rider. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The rider on the white horse with a robe dipped in blood, his name is the Word of God. That's Jesus, folks. Jesus, his name is the Word of God. Now watch, 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Wow. He leads the armies of heaven. The armies of heaven follow him because he's the commander who leads. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture his robe, and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Did you catch it? Jesus is the word of God, King of kings, Lord of lords, who rides a white horse and leads the armies of heaven who follow him as their commander, because he's King of kings, Lord of lords, in battle against God's enemies, and he has a sword from his mouth to slay God's enemies by the breath of his lips. So who is the commander of the armies of heaven? Who leads the armies of heaven in battle? Who is their leader, their commander? The word of God, Jesus Christ. So who is the captain of the host of the Lord that appeared to Joshua, whom Joshua fell before and worshiped? Jesus Christ before he became man. Jesus Christ in his pre-human existence. Revelation 19, 19. Beautiful PR. Are you a Syrian? Because in Assyrian, we, we use the term Baba for father. Revelation 19, 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him, Jesus, that sat on the horse and against his army. Did you catch it? Jesus on the horse, it's his army. Jesus is the leader of the army of heaven. The armies of heaven lead him. The reason why he's in the front, because... The commander is in the front leading the armies who follow him. He's the king of kings, lord of lords, the word of God with a sword in his mouth, a, a robe dipped in blood and leads the armies of heaven. Here is the captain of the hosts of the Lord that Joshua saw about 1,500 years earlier than John, whom Joshua realized this man with a sword, who's the commander of the army of the Lord, he's no mere creature. He's God in human form. He is my Lord, I'm his slave, and he's worthy of my worship. Did you catch it? Now, here's what's shocking, folks. You want to hear what's shocking? And we're, we're, we're done. Here's what's shocking. This is the passage, Joshua 5.14, that Adnan quoted to prove that Joshua is like Muslims and that Joshua prays like Muslims do. When Joshua was worshiping Jesus Christ as his Lord God, because that was Jesus who appeared to Joshua before Jesus became flesh. And then Joshua knew that Jesus there, he didn't know him as Jesus. That's a name given to him later. But that was Jesus. And he knew this one, he is my God in human form and worthy of my worship. Why would he quote a verse where Joshua is worshiping the captain of the hosts of the Lord? A distinct divine person from the Father, worshiping someone alongside the Father, someone distinct from the Father, a different person from the Father, and that someone later becomes Jesus of Nazareth. Why would you quote this verse to try to prove that Muslims are closer to the prophets when that proves that Joshua was a Trinitarian? Because Joshua knew that although the God of Israel is one, there's more than one person in that Godhead. And one of them stood on earth in human form with a sword as the commander of the army of Jehovah, who the New Testament later on identifies as Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This is the passage you're going to quote? You're kidding me, right? Folks, I hope it blessed you. I hope it blew your minds away. I hope you got shocked and rocked in a good way. To see that this book that I'm holding, 
right here. This book. Oh, there's more revelation. I haven't, I haven't even gotten around to refuting his attacks on Paul. Watch what's going to happen to him in Jesus' name. This book, this is God's perfect word. His preserved words in English, and he's preserved in all languages. His perfect word, the Holy Bible, the only revelation of God to mankind. This book is supernatural. This book is divine in origin. This book is the love letter of the only true God, our creator, who is madly in love with us. And that creator, his name is Jehovah. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Son became flesh, and he's Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who lives forever. And we who love him will live forever with him. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. This book, not the Quran, which is a book of Satan. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Wash us in your blood. Fill us with your spirit. Forgive us. Save us from our sinfulness, our flesh. Save us from the world. Save us from Satan. Save my daughters and fight for them, Lord Jesus. Preserve us in your love to live for you, die for you, and reign with you and provide our daily needs. We need you. We love you, Lord Jesus. Maran Ate. Our Lord, come in Jesus' name. Folks, I'll see you. I have to leave May 12th, God willing, if, if nothing is canceled. I leave for a road trip with a pastor and some brothers and sisters in a van going to several states preaching the gospel. Pray for our traveling mercies. Pray for our health, our provision, our protection. Pray for our loved ones we leave behind. Pray for my daughters. God preserve them, provide for them, and allow me to raise them to be godly women. Pray for my ministry. If you guys believe God has called me to full-time ministry, then subscribe to my channel. Pass on the link, get more people to subscribe, watch the videos, learn the information, learn the content, use it in your Bible studies, use it in your Sunday schools, use it in your evangelism, in your apologetic classes, right? And pray for the financial support to do this because I'm in full-time ministry. If you want to help financially with the trip from May 12th to the 19th, and God willing, I return after the 20th. So after the 20th, God willing, I'll start doing shows again. But if you want to support, and I need your support for the glory of God, my links to my Patreon accounts and PayPal are in the description box. The fastest way to give is now PayPal, but I need regular monthly subscribers and supporters as well. Love you guys for the sake of Jesus. And more importantly, Jesus loves you, and he's in love with you. And by the power of his Holy Spirit, may we be in love with him. Lord bless you and preserve you. And don't forget to pray for my two angels. My eight-year-old and my seven-year-old, two beautiful daughters that are a gift from Jesus. Christ is risen, risen indeed. Take care, guys. Love you.